Hello. Hello. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, on behalf of uh, President of Indian College of Anesthesiologists and the Executive of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I have tremendous pleasure in uh, in in uh, introducing this webinar. Well, uh, anesthesiologists are known for their expertise in the operation theater. Everyone knows about that. But there are a lot of areas which anesthesiologists now are engaged actively and uh, doing uh, a lot of good work. Uh, you know, like trauma is one, critical care is another, and pain management is uh, another one. And today's webinar is focused only on trauma management. Uh, trauma management has a lot of exciting opportunities for anesthesiologists and, uh, you know, in, in the management of uh, these patients. And uh, today uh, we have uh, very learned speakers uh, who will be dealing with various uh, issues related to, uh, to trauma. The moderators of uh, the webinar are Dr. K. Saxena from uh, Delhi and uh, Dr. Jitendra Kaur Makkar from Chandigarh PGI. And there are three speakers uh, who are very well known in their field of work, uh, that Kajal Jain uh, from PGI Chandigarh and Dr. Swagta Tripathi again from PGI Chandigarh and Dr. Shavi Sani. Dr. Shavi Sani has uh, devoted, uh, completely, uh, devoted herself completely to trauma management ever since uh, you know uh, she joined uh, all India shoe and uh, for introduction of the speakers I hand you over to uh, dr. Uh, Jashiri Sood but before I do that I would also like to announce that the next week we will have a webinar which is uh, which will be on AHA guidelines to uh, 2020 uh, I'm sure you're all aware that the AHA has issued recent guidelines uh, just a few months back. And the next webinar will be focused on uh, AHA uh, guidelines, recent uh, guidelines on resuscitation. So over to you, uh, Dr. Jashir Sooth. Uh, please go ahead with the, uh, with the further uh, announcements. Thank you very much. And good evening and happy new year to all of you. Um, well, as Dr. Baljeet has already said, we've got a very interesting webinar today, and we really select the ones which are so, so important for all of us, and especially the students. And today, to moderate our trauma session, we have two very senior and very uh, eminent uh, moderators. And uh, the first one is Dr. Rakesh Saxena. He's a senior consultant in our department of anesthesia, Sir Gangaram Hospital. He has been practicing orthopedics and trauma for the last, I think, almost 15, 20 years. He's completely dedicated to that speciality. And there's a lot of lot to learn uh, from him for all the students. And um, the second moderator, Dr. Jitender Makkar, she is a very dynamic young lady. And uh, she has got a whole lot of degrees. She has an MD, a DNB, an MNAMS, and an FRCS. I love those degrees. And uh, she has uh, also done a lot of work in <coughs> interventional medicine. She's a fellow of that. And she has a lot of uh, interest in pain. And in addition, she's also the coordinator of DM, of uh, trauma in uh, PGI Chandigarh. So we are very happy to have these moderators. I'm sure it will be a very lively discussion. And I would now invite them to introduce the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> uh, hello. Uh, we can hear you. Uh, uh, good what evening, everybody. Please go ahead. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce my fellow uh, uh, first speaker. First speaker is Professor Kajal Jain, and as you know, she is a professor of uh, anesthesiology and uh, intensive care at PGA Chandigarh. She has done a lot of work in the field. She is also secretary of the uh, <coughs> Association of the Obstetric Anesthetists of India, as well as uh, <coughs> she is uh, she is my invited speaker at so many. Uh, <coughs> meetings and faculties. She has got more than 100 publications to her name in national and international journals, as well as numerous awards also, and chapters in the book. So I will uh, invite Professor Kajal Jain to please start the proceedings. Professor Kajal Jain. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Rakesh, and uh, I will now do my screen share. Uh, okay. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. yes. Is my screen visible? Yeah. It is. Yes. It is. Please go ahead. Okay. So a very good evening to all of, all the seniors and the attendees who have come here to attend the ICA webinar. ICA webinars are getting very popular and we are seeing that every Wednesday, uh, Indian College is giving us a lot of academics. And this is one such academic which we are able to enjoy in the comfort of our home and our uh, curtains drawn up and our coffee mug ready. And here am I, I'm also ready. It's 7.05 and I've been given 20 minutes and today's webinar is focused on damage control advances in trauma resuscitation. So I'll be touching upon what are the advances in uh, trauma resuscitation with respect to damage control. So well, first and foremost, uh, to introduce you to the world of trauma, we all know that road traffic deaths are occurring worldwide. There have been millions of people who have died due to trauma. And so does it happen in India. Road fatalities in India have also been shown an increasing trend and the mortalities subsequently are very high. So then the question comes that what actually kills the patient from trauma? So when, it, when, when we talk about what kills the patient, I feel head injury is the number one cause which can cause mortality in these patients. And following this head injury, which can occur even at the site or even when the patients are brought in, the next second most common is hemorrhage. And this hemorrhage can be anywhere. It can be on the roads, that is in the pre-hospital settings or in our own emergency room. So you can see when a patient arrives to trauma center, patient bleed to death. So this is one very important cause which we need to handle immediately and effectively. So therefore this topic is very important for all of us. So if we look at this uh, statistics, we see that in the pre-hospital settings, this chart shows us the percentage of death occurs not only in the hospital during the first 24 hours, some of them even die in the pre-hospital area. So having said that, uh, we are very well aware that it, in our country, pre-hospital care is um, you know, still in the nascent stage. We haven't really graduated to bringing our patients effectively from the scene of injury. But yes, when they arrive to us in the first 24 hours, the percentage of deaths here also is very significant and we can contribute once the patient comes to us. So what happens when the patients come to us in, with severe hemorrhage or catastrophic hemorrhage? They have exsanguinated quite a bit and they generally fall in class three and class four of hemorrhage. That means they must have lost more than two liters of blood. And when they lose more than two liters of blood, we all know we see them in a shocked state. Their blood pressures are low, their pulp pressures are narrow, their heart rates are elevated and they are obtundent. So in such patients, it becomes very important to render immediate care. If, because if we do not do so, then these bleeding patients, they fall a trap into bloody vicious cycle. We are very familiar with the cycle, which says that a bleeding patient is uh, soon turns acidotic. And why does the patient turns acidotic? Because there are toxins which are released into the body due to shock and hypoperfusion. And this hypoperfusion also causes hypothermia. And ultimately this leads to coagulopathy. And again, if there's a coagulopathy, the bleeding will continue. And so therefore this cycle is a vicious cycle and it is totally bloody. So when we talk about coagulopathy, I just want to tell you all that this coagulopathy starts very soon. It doesn't happen when the patient comes to the hospital, it starts even before that. You can see the x-axis over here. And in the x-axis is a time frame. You see that it, the as trauma-associated coagulopathy occurs much faster. It has been shown that it occurs within 30 minutes of injury. And then when we try to resuscitate them, they again turn coagulopathic. And then later on during the 
resuscitate later part of the resuscitative phase they go into a prothrombotic because of the release of certain anticoagulant factors and coagulant coagulation factors so this whole triad causes a massively bleeding patient and uh, it also uh, determines the mortality so going ahead with the acute traumatic coagulopathy which is very very important as i already said whenever there occurs a trauma patient has uh, bleeds a lot goes into shock there is an associated tissue injury and the classical triad which we have already uh, seen uh, in the previous slide there is hemodilution hypothermia and acidemia all this promotes the release of activated protein c now this activated protein c is released from the injured tissue which also causes endothelial glycocalyx disruption and there is a platelet dysfunction consumption of all the coagulation factors and this later on causes autoheparinization hyperfibrinolysis and reduce clot clot strength and then reduce thrombin formation all put together the patient continues to bleed so here comes the concept of damage control if the patient continues to bleed we are we know that the patient is going to die so the word damage control was originally coined by the us navy and it was in reference to salvaging a ship it just meant that we should make the ship in a capacity to absorb the damage and maintain the mission integrity like do something so so small so that the ship you know reaches the uh, harbor safely and then you can do the major damage repair so this is what we are going to Im uh, imply in our clinical practice as medical colleagues that how we can do something which starts right at the site of injury and then continues through so that now the patient you know builds up himself and we are able to administer better care for him to survive so we we will talk about this in little bit in details and first and foremost i want you all to remember that this damage control resuscitation happens to be a time bound thing it it has to be done within the first 60 minutes it includes a bundle of strategies that that takes care of the conditions that exacerbate hemorrhage in trauma patients so whatever we have to do we have to do very fast it con consists of multiple actions and most importantly what i'm going to talk about is that permissive hypotension then early ratio based blood component therapy how to limit your crystalloid and colloid infusions then what about rapid rewarming then correction of other coagulopathic factors and finally some part of damage control surgery which is actually not in our domain but we need to know what damage control surgery actually means so we will think talk about this in the coming slides so when i say permissive hypotension it is also called hypotensive resuscitation appears a bit of an oxymoron just like sweet sorrow how can sorrow be sweet same way how can resuscitation be hypotensive well i'll tell you in a bit so where this uh, permissive hypotension actually it's a strategy of deferring or restricting fluid administration until hemorrhage is controlled while accepting a limited period of suboptimal end organ perfusion for this we have to aim for a systolic pp of 70 to 80 and a map of 50 and this is only recommended for a short period say for about 60 minutes because in that time you aim to get control of bleeding and then patient is you know resuscitated for the next step the historical background of permissive hypotension came from dr walter cannon in 1918 during the first world war and he said that we should you know so conserve the blood which is uh, required if you do not do that by giving higher blood pressure you may lose the blood that is sorely needed similarly henry beecher he is also an anesthesiologist he was also a prominent anesthesiologist during 1904 to 1976 he also opined that systolic blood pressure should be maintained at 80 to 90 and it is very beneficial before the surgery it's not important to give a higher blood pressure than that so with this historical background we had the first article which appeared in new england journal of medicine in the year 1994 dr bickel et al they tried to understand what happens if you do immediate versus delayed fluid res resuscitation if you keep 
a blood pressure less than 90. Well, when they targeted less than blood pressure, there is a 90 mm SG um, systolic blood pressure, they found that it improves the outcomes of the patient. So they, they concluded that delayed resuscitation group with the SBP of less than 90 had improved survival to discharge as well as reduced length of stay. This was the first paper which came. Following this, there were some animal studies in rats and pigs in which the authors, they studied a blood pressure of more than 80 and then permissive hypotension, that is a blood pressure less than, less than 80. And they found that in terms of survival, more animals survived in the permissive hypotension group. Similarly, some studies were conducted in humans later on and uh, taking the same end target, less than 80 mm Hg, they found that the p-values were significant for those patients who were exposed to lower blood pressure as per permissive hypotension. So why early, why not? Why early resuscitation? What actually happens with this low blood pressure and, and what we are trying to prevent? Actually, if you try to give a higher blood pressure, it, it may reverse vasoconstriction and directly displace early fibrin clots. So rather than doing all this, you can control the hemorrhage and then restore normal bulimia and high blood pressure. So basically this uh, concept works on the tagline, don't pop the clot. Don't give such high pressures that the clot pops. So the bottom line is that permissive hypotension seeks to avoid excessive fluid administration in an actively exsanguinating trauma patients with the potential benefit of prevention of clot disruption, hemodilution, hypothermia, metabolic acidosis. But remember, it's neither a treatment nor a substitute for definite hemorrhage control. It's only a stopgap arrangement. So when you talk about fluids, so what fluids should we give? What do the guidelines say? Let's have a look at what the guidelines say first. So these are the ATLS guidelines, the 10th edition, the last one which we have, it says that give one liter of crystalloid. From two liters, we have come down to one liter. And if it's a pediatric patient, you go 20 cc per kg for less than 40 kgs. And this happens during the initial assessment. When the choice of fluids is concerned, we all know that we have a whole, whole lot of uh, fluids to choose from. And we have all drifted towards the ones which are closer to plasma. So plasma light is the one which offers, uh, you know, constituents similar to human plasma. But whatever said and done, these have to be patient specific. Say you have a head injured patient, you can't go ahead with lactated ringers, you know it, you would choose some other solution. What is more important to understand is that we are not going to use more than a liter of crystalloid. What about colloids? Well, no colloids because they increase the risk of kidney injury and they are very expensive. They have been shown to not offer any survival benefits over crystalloids. I will not talk more about this because this is only a very small part of this whole talk. But I just want to tell you that some of you must be thinking, can I use new generation gelatins? There is some evidence to suggest that, okay, polygeline at all, they are low molecular weight, they are cheaper. They are rapidly excreted by kidneys. They have less renal impairment than starches. And there is no upper limit of volume that can be infused unlike starches and dextron. How, and it may be considered in our countries, like in our country, in remote or rural settings to prevent crystalloid overuse till definitive care is available. But do remember that they may cause anaphylactoid reactions. So the patient is actively bleeding. And what next? The next part, which is very important in damage control resuscitation is to achieve hemostatic re resuscitation. So when I say hemostatic resuscitation, what do I mean? I mean, give a balanced transfusion and you can see you give everything together. It is not that you first in transfuse bloods, then you bring your fresh frozen and then you get your platelets. No, you go together. With the red blood cells, you give fresh frozen plasma and we also give platelets. So this is the one of the very important tenets of damage control resuscitation and a very, very good advance. 
So from where did it come? The first study which directly ad addressed the early coagulopathy of trauma was done by Dr. Holcomb. He has done a lot of studies in damage control resuscitation. Probably it was his area of interest. And he said that we have given considerable attention to the technical details of damage control surgery and reversing acidosis, hypothermia, which is present during admission. And we haven't bothered much about reversing the coagulopathy, which is related to the blood loss present at that time. So he decided to study it further. And he said, okay, let's keep the pressures to 90 mm Hg and restore the intravascular volume with plasma as a primary resuscitation fluid in at least one is to one or one is to two ratio with PRBC. And his initial clinical experience showed that these ratios decrease the mortality. So this is how we started thinking about giving early on blood and not loading our patients with crystalloids. The next study which I want to tell you is a very important study that is this is a PROMIT trial. It's the prospective observational multicenter major trauma transfusion study. It, is, it was published in JAMA in 2013. And here the authors, the same author, Holcomb, they, uh, they carried out this study with the objective to relate in hospital mortality to early transfusion of plasma or platelets. Like they wanted to see if patients are receiving plasma and platelets with RBC, which is that group which is getting benefited and in, in what is the time period in which they will be benefited. So they start, the study was done in 10 US level one trauma centers. So it's a very important study. And they found that in the first six hours, patients who receive ratios less than one is to two were three to four more uh, time, like, times more likely to die than patients who receive one is to one or higher. So this study promoted the idea that do one is to one. Like it should not be that you give two blood and then you give one plasma and one platelet. Go one is to one. So this PROMIT study was a very important landmark study. Then there came another study, uh, which, which is called the proper randomized clinical trials. This is a pragmatic randomized study in which the authors, again, they studied one is to one is to two ratio and vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis one is to one is to one ratio. So this, also, this was also published in JAMA. So in this study, a large number of patients were assessed for eligibility, but only 680 were randomized. 338 were randomized to one is to one is to one group and 342 were randomized to one is to one is to two group. And then what did they see? They saw there was no mortality benefit, but yes, as far as achieving hemostasis was concerned, one is to one is to one group fare much better than one is to one is to two. So the p-values were significant for equally balanced uh, resuscitation, hemostatic resuscitation. So this is what we mean by achieving a balanced resuscitation. So finally, we also had some practice management guidelines from the Eastern Association of Trauma of Surgery. This is uh, in 2017 um, journal. And here they have clearly said that in severe trauma, we recommend the use of a massive transfusion or damage control resuscitation protocol in comparison to no protocol to reduce the mortality. And the second point is, they said we recommend targeting a high ratio of plasma and platelets to red blood cells as compared to the low ratio to reduce the mortality. So next is what about fibrinolytics? So we all know this is the CRASH-2 trial. The CRASH-3 trial has also come, but I focused on the CRASH-2 trial because it is uh, on uh, the elective surgeries, like it is on the other surgeries rather than the head injury surgeries. So in this surgery, the like, uh, background was like, they considered that cranexamic acid would reduce bleeding in these patients. And they saw that patients are benefited. So the cranexamic acid should be considered in bleeding trauma patients. And then coming to hemostatic adjuncts like factor 7a, well, if given early in resuscitation, this forest plot shows us that it is equivocal. It is not really, you know, favoring, but they say it may decrease the need for massive transfusion. On top of that, we all know factor seven is uh, very expensive and not easily available, but yes, tranexamic acid is, uh, you know, cheap, 
easily available can be administered with uh, without any you know uh, much expertise is required so again what are the practice management guidelines they say that in adult patients with severe trauma we cannot recommend for or against the use of factor 7a as a hemostatic adjunct in comparison to no factor 7a however with severe trauma we conditionally recommend the use of tranexamic acid as an in hospital hemostatic adjunct in comparison to no tranexamic acid so what about fibrinogen concentrates and prothrombin complex concentrates which are you know uh, freeze dried and marketed so there's a some concept called remote damage control resuscitation so remote damage control resuscitation pertains to pre hospital settings in a setting where you do not have access to any blood or blood product so in those settings they say that you can go a, a stepwise approach to achieve hemostasis so you can use tranexamic acid to support the clot formation you may use fibrinogen concentrate and to increase thrombin generation you may use prothrombin complex concentrates well we are coming back to whole blood programs again and this whole blood programs uh, has a big history which cannot be you know uh, narrated here for the sake of uh, simplicity i will just say that whole blood programs are finding their way in early resuscitation say you have to lift a patient from a far off place where component therapies are not available people are recommending the use of whole blood programs because they say that in stored blood you do find the components which are effective if you keep them at a temperature of 4 to 8 degree centigrade so if you can manage to do that you can even go with the whole blood rather than giving crystalloids or not giving blood at all so we will be seeing in the next program maybe we will be seeing more studies done with whole blood so when we talk about surgical strategy strategies in dcr we should remember that damage control surgery is a part and parcel of resuscitation it is not a different thing because patients are partially resuscitated and then they are sent for a surgery in which they are this is just an abbreviated surgery it is not a full blown surgery patient's abdomen or whatever part is open decontaminated and then patient is brought back to the critical care so it it is a part of dcr it is not a separate thing and it is much short we must also remember that all these patients need to be warmed with insulating foils blankets and removal of wet clothes we should give warmed infusions try to give heated air inhalations gastric or body lavage with warm waters and try to keep the er temperature neutral well calcium is a very important uh, iron and we all know that it uh, it forms uh, you know an important uh, um, pro uh, it is very important for the coagulation cascade if calcium is deficient we are not going to achieve the coagulation disorders so right now in another in this in this 2020 volume of journal of trauma authors have speculated the role of calcium as a lethal diamond rather than a lethal triad they say that if you don't give calcium properly if you don't maintain the ionized calcium at 0.9 you may land up your patient with ongoing coagulopathy so we need to be very mindful of giving calcium infusions so to sum it all up i must say that in trauma settings c is much more than abc like you have to restore circulation much more than abc and for that we need to do damage control resuscitation we should minimize crystalloids during early resuscitation allow permissive hypotension transfer blood products in a ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1 and this is the hemostatic ladder which we should follow i thank you very much for listening to this uh, talk uh thank you professor kajal it was it was a very informative and good talk and now i will request professor jitendra kaur to please introduce the next speaker professor jitendra kaur please introduce the professor, uh, professor swagata tripathi to the audience uh, good evening everyone uh, i am co hosting this webinar along with uh, dr saxena uh, well two things were very clear from the from the uh, from the talk delivered by professor kajal jain 
firstly trauma resuscitation has come a long way and now we have we have come to know about the need of the early resuscitation and secondly trauma resuscitation continuum continues to say that early resuscitation is associated with the very decreases the mortality and morbidity in the patients well again very rightly said by her is that it is the head injury which is the commonest uh, trauma seen in the patients and uh, more than uh, you know uh, uh, and the maximum amount of head injury occurs in patients who are less than 45 years of age and this head injury is the cause of death uh, in these people so it becomes very important to understand that how early management of patients with traumatic brain injury is going to decrease the morbidity and mortality of these patients and who else is going to be better in this uh, better in explaining this than uh, dr swarta tripathi who has done her fellowship in uh, neuro neurocritical care from liverpool she is working as a regional professor at uh, aims bhubaneswar and um, dr tripathi is now going to tell us how early management of patients with traumatic brain injury improves the outcome and probably decreases morbidity and mortality in these patients over to you swarta uh, very good evening uh, dr jeet thank you so much for introducing me into this talk Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, my uh, am I are you able to see me? Yes, yes, we are able to see your screen. Perfect. Great. So, uh, like uh, Sajid just said, this talk in the next twenty minutes is going to be the early management of patients with traumatic brain injury, and this is a very important topic because it affects the younger. more productive population the world over and in the next 20 minutes we will be looking at why it is very important to look at early management of traumatic brain injury and where should this early management start from how exactly the early management should progress some situation specific management will be discussed and we will talk about uh, the new or the present evidence that dictates the early management in traumatic brain injury i have to make a disclaimer that we will not be going into pediatric traumatic brain injury neither will we go into the core critical care of traumatic brain injury we will be focusing on the early management most of the slides are based on the guidelines the most recent um, management guidelines for traumatic brain injury and the enls a uh, course that tells you how to manage the traumatic brain injury so first coming to the why why is it important to manage the traumatic brain injury very early like it was just mentioned under 40 it is a common cause of death and worse of disability the higher rates of morbidity and mortality are seen in our countries the low middle income and the low income countries therefore it is fast becoming a global health challenge because we can hardly afford to have this high mortality and morbidity and experience has seen has shown that in the west or in the first world simple interventions as in legislation or helmet use and simple use of protocols in the management of early traumatic brain injury has improved outcomes if you look at head injury majority especially in the low income countries 44% head injury patients are due to road traffic accident followed by 26% who are it's because of falls 13% in sports and then assault 17% this is a little skewed in the west where falls are more in the more than the road traffic accidents so when we are looking at why we should manage brain injury only we come to the very uh, oft spoken about concepts of primary injury and secondary injury very simply told primary injury is what happens when the head is hit by a force this causes tissue deformation axonal shearing contusion necrosis and disruption of the blood brain barrier but the secondary injury is also called the avoidable injury this is the cerebral edema or the cytokine storms the mitochondrial damage excitotoxicity and the ischemia which usually follow the primary injury after seconds minutes or days this is the focus of early management of traumatic brain injury primary injury is the purview of 
administrators or rule makers or even the person himself who is getting injured if he is wearing a helmet maybe the primary head injury will be less but the secondary head injury is where we come into play so when we talk of head injury it can be of various types i will not be going in the next 20 minutes into how the scanning or the imaging looks like because i'm sure we are more or less aware that once a patient comes in a first imaging will give us an idea of what is grossly wrong with the patient as far as traumatic brain injury goes what is more important to understand that no matter what is the macroscopic view on the ct scan what is happening inside the brain is different and it is very different in different patients and different conditions so for example in this slide we can see that whether you have an sdh or a contusion or a diffuse axonal injury what is happening in the macrovascular level inside is very different for the three different conditions and this is perhaps why after the early management the outcomes and the management differ in different patients and we have so little evidence base to go on because every patient and every type of tbi is different but the focus again of early tbi management like i said is the prevention of secondary brain injury the cascade of which is similar in the different types of injury so what are these causes of secondary brain injury these are the commonly seen things that we day in and day out as anesthetists probably see in the er when the patient has come to us and we get a call to go and see these patients hypoxia ischemia hypotension hematoma expansion cerebral edema compression of the brain intracranial hypertension fever and seizures these are all common causes that worsen outcomes of patients with traumatic brain injury and are avoidable the monroe kelly doctrine and the principle that it is important to maintain the perfusion of the brain and the perfusion depends on the cerebral perfusion pressure which is the mean arterial pressure minus the icp icp increases in the various situations we just saw these are the causes that cause secondary uh, injury to the brain and increased icp which causes decreased effective flow and reduces and collapses the veins is what causes the problem in early traumatic brain injury so where should it start when we are talking about early injury we have now seen what causes the early injury so where should the management of early tbi start now interestingly i would like to bring out this very old paper and i'm sure all of us can recognize the author of this paper long back in the west they were debating about how head injuries are badly managed in the a and e department and they were also thinking whether they want to blame the neurosurgeons now in this paper they asked are head injuries badly managed and if where is that bad managed focused in is it in the er is it the pre hospital they did a lot of neuropathologic studies earlier in the 1970s and it was shown that when the patient died 91% of them showed evidence of secondary brain injury only 5% had evidence of isolated raised icp and only 5% had evidence of neither so we can see 96% of patients have died due to secondary brain injury and they saw that an expanding hematoma was the intracranial pathology which caused maximum deterioration the same paper then compared that once there was a simple change in practice instead of waiting for a long time to bring the patient into the icu or into the er or intubate them or give attention to them if you do it early versus you do it late in between the two chunks of years of 94 to 90 of 74 to 77 and 78 to 80 there was a vast improvement in outcomes so simple change in protocols could improve outcomes when patients were looked at earlier in traumatic brain injury once again prevention of the secondary brain injury is the focus of tbi management and it has to start from the pre hospital setting continue in the ed and also in the icu now being in india we always say that what pre hospital setting we don't have a pre hospital setting so for us wherever the patient comes to us 
the early management has to start from there. We know the severity has been divided into mild, moderate, and severe TBI, depending on the GCS, and the management would depend on what severity of TBI you have come with. To contrast that old 1984 paper to a more recent one, it has been seen in this much larger study of 14 Austrian centers that when they took patients with traumatic brain injury and did an RCT to just see whether evidence-based management of one group improved outcomes or not. You know, simple things that we all know. The TBI guidelines tell us that please we'll bring them early, ABC early, ICP should be uh, controlled, cerebral perfusion pressure should be maintained. If you actually do it, does it improve outcomes? And they saw that among this bundle of treatments, fluid management, monitoring, normal ventilation, and thromboelastography measurements, where it was easiest to implement them successfully, and it led to a significant improvement of the patient outcomes, also resulting in decreased hospital mortality. As we all know, decreasing mortality is something difficult to find in critical care and anesthesia studies. So this is important. So now that we know why we have to manage TBI early and where should it start from, we come to how, which well is quite basic of management of TBI and we will move through it a little quickly. It starts with every trauma management, the ABCDE system. We are looking at the airway. So wherever the GCS score is less than eight, airway has to be protected. Even if it is nine to 12, but the patient is severely agitated, you must think of decreasing the agitation by sedating him. And for that, airway protection will be needed. Otherwise the ICP will raise. If you perceive that he will deteriorate fast, or if there is a planning for intra or inter-hospital transfer, even if it is for CT scan, it is best to protect the airway. Looking at B and C, the the goal for SpO2 has to be more than 90% and a PaO2 of more than six, 60 millimeters mercury to decrease mortality in TBI patients. This is well known and it is basic good medicine. Hypotension will result in brain hypoperfusion. So early use of fluid resuscitation and starting vasopressors like noradrenaline to make the SBP more than 100 or 110, depending on the age of your patient, is vital. We all know the cascade of how to maintain the ICP. Even if we are not really actively measuring the ICP, again, this is good medicine practice, head and elevation, prevention of any ties, maintaining normocapnia, adequate sedation. Like this is something that we anesthetists, uh, this is our forte. And even if we go to the casualty and see somebody thrashing around, it should, it should be our holy grail to stop there and tell them that please sedate your patient. CSF drainage by ventriculostomy, osmotherapy, paralysis if needed, and once it is refractory, to the next level of care for ICP. Manitol versus hypertensive saline, we all know is ages old debate. Whatever we have wisely with monitoring can be used. Caesar prophylaxis, there is good evidence that when we start within 24 hours of injury and continue for seven days following severe traumatic brain injury, it will reduce the incidence of early post-traumatic seizures and phenytoin or levetiracetam can either be used safely. The role of steroids in TBI is now out after the CRASH-1 trial. It increases mortality. Prophylactic hypothermia has no good evidence behind it and Coagulopathy reversal, if done, has to be evidence-based. Check the prothrombin time, INR, and keep repeatedly seeing it. Otherwise, it may harm the patient more because most many times these patients may have multiple trauma as well as we just heard in the last lecture. I will just put this slide extra about sedation and analgesia because it's very close to my heart. It's very, very important, very basic that intubation is done under ideal conditions. A thrashing patient in intubation will lose all the benefit of intubating a patient with traumatic brain injury. And even after intubation, a good, comfortable patient is very important to take care of the basics of ICP and maintain cerebral perfusion. Early management imaging is very important. So what would be the indications of CTR 
angiography, MR angiography in a traumatic brain injury patient, a penetrating head injury, or a fracture over a venous sinus, a neurologic deficit, which is not explained by the primary CT, select spine injuries, petrous bone fractures, facial fractures of lipo two or three, or a vascular cause for intracranial hemorrhage, which is confusing you with the trauma. These will be the indications. Where would you call for an early neurosurgery consultation? One must not wait that once the neurosurgeon comes only, I will manage the early traumatic brain injury. So whenever it is, you've already diagnosed the GCS is falling and you feel it is due to the brain, then the moderate or severe TBI should have a neurosurgeon looking at him so that it's not too late before the intervention starts. If a patient has a mild TBI, but there are other extracranial injuries, if there is a skull fracture, signs of CSF leak with clear or serosanguineous fluid from the ears or noses, usually a conservative approach is taken for the first 48 hours in these cases, but it is best done under the vision of a neurosurgeon. Lateralizing signs or neurologic examination or C-spine injury. It is important to recognize when the ICP is so high that in many of the in any of the areas the brain is starting to herniate. So early management of traumatic brain injury also means early recognition of these signs. So repeatedly checking and monitoring the pupils, doing GCS, checking for progressive GCS if it is a drop of more than two points and the triad of hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular respiration should warn people about the possibility of herniation of the brain. Just two slides quickly about situation-specific management. If a patient has acute SDH, the guidelines say that any acute SDH with a uh, thickness of more than 10 millimeters or a shift of more than five millimeters or of any size who has a decline of GCS or has asymmetric or non-reactive pupils will be a candidate for surgery. An acute EDH of more than 30 cc, more than 15 mm or more than five mm midline shift with a GCS of less than eight. Contusions if the patient is comatosed but the other injuries are survivable and there is a brain midline shift of more than five millimeters. A cerebral hemorrhage, which is resulting in a mass effect or a brainstem compression or a hydrocephalus or a depressed skull fracture. So these are warning signs that will probably benefit from early neurosurgical intervention. Intracranial pressure monitoring. Uh, I have cited again from the best uh, trip trial from uh, Brazil and South America, which shows that it may not really matter if you are not a center which does ICP monitoring very frequently, then the outcomes can be good if equally good if the clinical management is done well. So ICP monitoring, the guidelines are to treat it if it is more than 22 and to use an EVD. Brain tissue monitoring is done in fewer centers, but it is also there in the guidelines. And finally, just a look at what is new in the management, early management of traumatic brain injury. GCS is ages old. We have a new modification in GCS now, where you also look at the pupil reactivity score of the patient. So if both the pupils are unreactive, it gets a score of two. And if neither pupil is reactive, it, if neither pupil is unreactive, that is both are reacting well, then the score is zero. You subtract it from the usual GCS score, and that will tell you the real GCS or the modified GCSP, and then the prognosis can be given to the patients. It comes from the same group that has Dr. Teasdale and all that had done the original GCS. The bottom line in the other new evidence about traumatic brain, brain injury, decompressive craniectomy does not improve the quality of life. It may improve the length of life from both the DECTRA and the rescue ICP trials. I don't have time to go into detail of these trials, but if you can just see the uh, graph here, the unfavorable functional outcome is higher and we don't know whether we want to do that to our patients. Hypothermia again is out as a result of these uh, trials. The crash one has said steroids and the crash three trial tells us that early tranexamic acid in mild to moderate head injury has improved patient outcomes and decreased mortality. 
Finally, early traumatic brain injury. If you have to remember 10 points about it, then these are the 10 points. In TBI, if you are also, if the patient is also anticoagulated, if you're thinking of reversing it, do it evidence-based, do it early. Analgio sedation is very important. Early interventions be very, uh, the monitoring has to be very acute to decide for early interventions. Neuroprotective and lung protective mechanical ventilation is important, but they are, they may clash with each other. So it has to be looked at very closely. Secondary injury has to be minimized. Any extremes of physiology have to be minimized. That should be the mantra. There is no big magic word to it. Avoid extremes of physiology. Mechanical supports as needed. Patient monitoring has to be closed. And if we have access to high-end monitoring, like multimodality monitoring, then it can be used. But usually there is less place for it in early TBI management. Early aggressive care has to be kept in mind. And surgical management, whenever needed, has to be asked for early enough. With that, I end my call and I hope I'm in time. I thank everybody for this opportunity once again. Thank you. Thank you, Swagata, for elaborating such an important topic in such a small time. Uh, I understand the discussions are going to be in the end. So I will hand over the stage to Dr. Saxena for introducing Dr. Chari. Dr. Saxena, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, now can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Now, thank you. Now, this is my privilege to introduce Professor Chavi Sahani. She is at present a professor of anesthesiology at Jayaprakash Narayan Apex Trauma Center at Ames, New Delhi, since 2005. And her area of interest include trauma and regional anesthesia. And she has more than 50 publications to her credit. And now I invite uh, Professor Chavi to please start his talk. Professor Chavi, please. Yes. Twenty twenty. Now, for the elderly hip fractures, we need the standardized multi multidisciplinary disciplinary pa uh, care pathways, which will help to reduce mortality, reduce the time to surgery, length of hospital stay, remobilization, and lead to prompt re-enablement and rehabilitation, finally leading to reduced financial and personal burden. Now, there are various guidelines available for this which include the Association of Anesthetists from Great Britain and Ireland Safety Guidelines, that is the UGB Guidelines. Then we have the NICE Guidelines, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, Scottish Guidelines, British Orthopedic Association, and then International Fragility Fracture Network, 2018. There are various Cochrane reviews which were done in 2016, anesthesia for hip fracture surgery in adults, hip protectors for preventing hip fractures in older people, peripheral nerve blocks for hip fracture, perioperative fluid volume optimization following proximal hip fracture, or red blood transfusion for people undergoing hip fracture surgery. Since the publication of guidelines in 2011, there have been various studies and various Cochrane reviews, which have led to the development of guidelines for the management of hip fractures 2020. Now these guidelines, they now these guidelines show a greater. They recommend a greater role of the anesthesiologist in preoperative preparation, that is rehabilitation, for uh, then uh, which includes analgesia before the surgery and after administration, after admission, then remobilization. Remobilization is. Now for remobilization is actually the mobility of the patient on the day. Of the day after the surgery, which is considered to be the key performance indicator. And the, there can be reasons for, there can be difficulties because of pain, hypotension, delirium, and anemia. And re-enablement is the movement or the mobility of the patient three to five days after surgery. And again, 
one of the reasons for the problems can be pain, hypertension, bladder or bowel issues and even cognitive issues. Again, anesthesiologists might be associated with all these. So they form an integral part of the management for the patients with hip fracture in both during the, uh, during the pre-operative, operative and post-operative period. And later on, habilitation, although it is mainly dependent upon the organizational factors, but anesthesiologists also play a role in this because supposing if a patient does not, uh, is, has inadequate analgesia and requires more opioids, he would be, he can be sedated, he can aspirate, and there can be problem with discharge of the patient and further leading to delayed rehabilitation. So as a result of which, anesthesiologists form an integral part to all the parts of fractures, um, care pathways, hip fracture care pathways. <laughs> now, depending, now, this was the Cochrane review, which was done in 2018 about the nerve blocks for hip fractures. And if, uh, the, the authors concluded that peripheral nerve blocks lead not only lead to a reduction in the preoperative pain, they also lead to a reduction in the pain and quadriceps spasm at rest and movement in the post-operative period. It reduces the time to mobilization and also reduces the opioid consumption. So based on these findings, the recent guidelines suggest a single short nerve block in the ED on admission. And if there's a difference of more than six hours between admission and surgery, the block can be repeated in the OT. It can be used for positioning and moreover, it can also help to provide post-operative analgesia. And ultrasound guided femoral and facial yucca block have been, uh, they have been uh, provide, they have been studied and they have been compared and have been found to, pro uh, to provide good analgesia and the recent pericapsular nerve group blocks, that is the PENG blocks. There is little evidence or little data available on the efficacy of these blocks. Again, there's a little evidence available on the continuous nerve block technique for the hip fractures. However, there is no contraindication and th these blocks can be easily used and should be used even in anticoagulated patients. Now we all know that the timing matters in hip fractures. So in the, in the recent hip attack investigation, which, uh, which was conducted in 69 hospitals in 17 countries, it was uh, the, the investigators <clears throat> compared accelerated surgery, that is surgery within six hours with the standard care in hip fracture. And the authors found out that the accelerated surgery or the surgery within six hours did not reduce 90 day mortality or a composite of major complications, that is mortality and non-fatal myocardial infarction, stroke, thromboembolism, sepsis, pneumonia, life-threatening and major bleeding. There was a, however, there was a low risk of delirium there was faster mobilization and a shorter length of stay, hospital stay in the patients who were in the accelerated surgery group. So on the basis of these uh, studies, so the recent recommendations are that, that there's a time, uh, these, uh, the patients should be operated within 36 hours limit and surgery should be delayed only if the benefits of additional medical treatment outweigh the risk of delaying surgery. And during this period also, Anesthesiologists should be proactively involved in the optimization of the patient for surgery. Now, we all are aware about the effects of aging and the various comorbidities associated in this age group, which includes hypertension seen in 50 to 60 percent patients, then um, cardiac failure, diabetes, arthrosis, cancer, CAD, dementia, repeated falls, hearing loss and vision loss. So it was in 2011 guidelines, there were few uh, acceptable reasons for delay, which was anemia, hemoglobin of less than eight or electrolyte imbalance, which would included a serum sodium of less than 120 or more than 150, se serum potassium less than 2.8 or more than 5.5, reversible coagulopathy, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled or acute onset, left ventricular failure, correctable cardiac arrhythmias with heart rate of more than 120 beats per minute, chest infection with sepsis. But, so the preoperative assessment includes, huh, 
Uh, so on the basis of uh, this American College of Surgery, they provided a framework for preoperative assessment of geriatric patients, which includes the preoperative cardiac risk certification and optimization, pulmonary evaluation, functional assessment, and nutrition. Now cardiac evaluation of a geriatric hip trauma patient. So if there's a cardiac disease, if the patient has an active cardiac condition, the patient is to be evaluated and treated as per the ACC or AHA guidelines and then proceed for surgery. If there is no cardiac condition and the functional meds are more than four, again, we can proceed for surgery. However, if we cannot determine the functional capacity and the patient has no clinical risk factor, again, we proceed for surgery. But if there are risk factors, we can proceed for surgery with heart rate control, or we can consider testing if only if it will change the management. The risk factors that we consider include the coronary artery disease, heart failure, diabetes, CBA, or renal insufficiency. The ACC AHA clinical risk predictors have been divided into low risk, or intermediate, or high risk, where advanced age, abnormal ECG, rhythms other than sinus, low functional capacity, history of stroke, or uncontrolled hypertension have been categorized as low risk, whereas unstable coronary syndrome, significant arrhythmias, decompensated CHF, or severe valvular diseases are considered as high risk. Now, echocardiography. So uh, in the recent guidelines, the, it is recommended that there should be no delay in patients with valvular heart disease pending echocardiography. Although echocardiography helps in, uh, eco helps in risk stratification, but carefully administered, invasively monitored GA or spinal anesthesia, that is anesthesia with invasive monitoring, maintaining coronary and cerebral perfusion pressure with short-term admission to post-op high-level care unit can help the patient. And we can go ahead without asking for echocardiography or wasting time. Now, functional assessment can be done using history, examination, or objective testing, which can be done on the basis of activities of daily living or the instrumental activities of daily living, like shopping, food preparation, and other like gait, walking speed. All these can give us an idea about the functional activities of the patients. Now, uh, in the recent guidelines, the risk stratification is considered as a must for all the geriatric patients coming for hip fracture surgery because we know there are certain non-modifiable risk factors like age, frailty, comorbidities, and polyformacy. On top of it, the additional risk is due to the fracture, surgery, and anesthesia. So it is difficult to quantify. So there are various tools available like Nottingham Hip Fracture School frail, uh, tool, frailty score, and the organ specific assessment tool, which the recent guidelines have um, stressed upon to be done before taking up a, a geriatric patient, any geriatric patient for surgery. Now, most of these geriatric patients, 30 to 40% of the patients are on anticoagulants and antiplatelets. So we need to weigh the risk between surgical bleeding and vertebral canal hematoma versus abrupt cessation of medication and delay to surgery. And it is more difficult if the patient is on dual antiplatelets or if the, uh, the medication has started recently. On the other hand, vertebral canal hematoma, although the uh, risk is small, it is one, into, one is to one lakh 18,000, but still uh, we need to be careful and we need to be uh, an early diagnosis and prompt management helps in patients with vertebral canal hematoma. Now the um, guidelines uh, provider, this is a table provided for the anticoagulants and antiplatelets which the patient might be on. And we all are aware that if the patient is on aspirin, we can proceed with the surgery and we can proceed with the spinal anesthesia, spinal anesthesia also. Similarly for clopidogrel, Although it is better to proceed with surgery and the GA monitoring blood loss and considering platelet transfusion if there are concerns regarding bleeding, but if GA poses greater risk to patient, then we can um, uh, go ahead with spinal anesthesia, taking care not to give too many pricks and be careful. Then we have ticagrelor. Again, uh, the elimination half-life is eight to 12 hours. Ideally, we should proceed with surgery with GA, monitoring for blood loss and uh, considering platelet transfusion if there is risk. But if GA poses greater risk to patient, then we can proceed with single shot spinal anesthesia with the thin needle. 
Again, similarly, we, uh, with the, if the patient is on unfractionated IV heparin, it has to be stopped two to four hours pre-op, and we can proceed with spinal four hours later. Same way with low molecular weight heparin. If the patient is on prophylactic dose, the, it is 12 hours delay, and if the patient is on treatment dose, we can uh, go ahead with 20, after 24 hours monitoring the blood loss. Then warfarin, we can uh, we need to reverse with vitamin K and repeat INR. And if immediate reversal is required, thrombin complex. And we can proceed with spinal anesthesia only if the INR is less than 1.5. Now, Debigatron, again, in all these uh, newer oral uh, uh, anticoagulant, anticoagulant agents, it is always better to go ahead with GA. However, the surgery can be considered after 24 to 48 hours after reviewing the renal function, and uh, we can consider immediate reversal also. With the rivaroxaban, ep epixaban, edoxaban, again, we can partially reverse with prothrombin complex, consider surgery after 12 to 24 hours, but we need to review the renal function, and obviously, general anesthesia would be a better option if possible. Now the perioperative blood transfusion. Now it was in 2011 guidelines that perioperative hemoglobin of more than eight grams per deciliter or more than 10 grams per deciliter for patients with history of IHD was considered for patients undergoing hip fracture surgery. Whereas then later on Carlson et al, they compared restrictive transfusion using a threshold of eight gram with liberal transfusion or using a threshold of 10. And they found that there was no difference in mortality or mobility at 60 days. And this was further reiterated by systemic Cochrane reviews in uh, 2012 and 2015. However, in 2016, the systematic review and meta-analysis found that restrictive strategies increased the risk of inadequate oxygen supply and composite events like myocardial infarction, arrhythmia, unstable angina, stroke, KKI, were more, and uh, as well as the mortality within 30 days. So the recent guidelines recommend to uh, weigh the risk of anemia-related organ ischemia to heart, brain, and kidneys versus the immunosuppressive th effect of blood transfusion in elderly. So again, uh, the perioperative hemoglobin of nine gram per deciliter in, in frail patients or 10 gram per deciliter in patients who have a history of IHD or who fail to mobilize on post of day one is recommended. Now we are aware of the, uh, now coming to anesthesia for geriatric hip fracture surgery. So we are aware of the problems with general anesthesia or reach and as well as regional anesthesia. There's problems, advantages, as well as disadvantages of both the techniques. With general anesthesia, we have less hypotension, less episodes of CVA, whereas with regional anesthesia, there is reduced early mortality, less CVT, less post-op confusion, faster recovery, but is contraindicated in impaired coagulation. So there have been a lot of studies about the anesthesia technique, mortality, and length of stay after hip fracture study surgery with variable results. The study was uh, published in 2014 in JAMA and they looked at the 30 day mortality and hospital length of stay. And they found that regional anesthesia was not associated with a lower 30 day mortality and there was a modestly shorter length of stay. Later on, this Cochrane review done in 2016 for uh, uh, this anesthesia for hip fracture surgery in adults comparing the neurexal block versus general anesthesia. And uh, the results, they found that there was no difference in mortality at one month between neurexal block and general anesthesia. There was no difference for pneumonia, MI, congestive heart failure, CVA, pulmonary embolism, AKI, RBC transfer, or length of stay. And there was no risk, no difference in risk of DVT with low molecular weight heparin in both. But without the use of LMWH, the risk of DVT was less with neurexial block. Hmm. So uh, the recommendations are to provide, to use an age appropriate or lower dose of anesthetic agent. It could be either neurexial block or general anesthesia with supplemental nerve blockage and careful blood pressure monitoring, as it is seen that hypotension leads to a significant increase, a significant increase in five and 30 day mortality. So intraoperative management, 
fluid and electrolyte management. Now with the enhanced recovery after surgery or the ERAS protocol for all the surgeries. So we, it is recommended to avoid prolonged preoperative fasting, restrict intraoperative fluid therapy. Uh, central venous pressure monitoring is a poor predictor of volume responsiveness. So it is not recommended but intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring or invasive blood pressure monitoring for beat to beat pressure monitoring is recommended, especially in high-risk patients. Temperature control, taking care of the position is again recommended for the patients uh, uh, in this age group. Now, post-operative management. So there are now four models of orthogeriatric, starting with the orthopedic unit and geriatric consultant to a geriatric unit and orthopedic consultant. So that is, um, this is the ultimate, but in all these, the anesthesiologists have a rule till the patient is discharged from the search, uh, from the hospital. Again, we have to take care of analgesia, early mobilization, rehabilitation, fluid and nutrition, because dis uh, dyselectrolytemia is one of the commonest cause of morbidity and mortality in the post-operative period in this age group. Antithrombotic prophylaxis should be started as soon as possible, according to the American College of uh, Physicians uh, guidelines, and it should be given for at least 10 to 14 days, a maximum up to 35 days. So this is um, the, a nutshell or a summary of the standardized hip fracture um, routine protocol. So preoperative analgesia is must. We need to risk stratify these patients and we, identify and treat those uh, comorbidities which are reversible. <clears throat> and according to ERAS protocol, we minimize the preoperative fasting and we determine the uh, post-operative level of care. And we aim for a to discuss and confirm perioperative plan, plan with the multidisciplinary uh, preoperative meeting or it should be a multidisciplinary task. Intraoperative, again, spinal anesthesia, the lowest appropriate doses should be used. Avoid the opioid sedation and then blood pressure control. Again, if we need to, if required, we can go in for invasive blood pressure monitoring and again, restricted crystalloids. If they are using the planning to use bone cement, we should be aware of the bone cement implantation syndrome. And then again, the uh, nerve blocks, ultrasound guided nerve blocks and uh, uh, the aid adjusted depth can be used using target control infusion, MAC, BIS, or entropy, although it is not recommended for all the patients, if available, can be used. And again, the, and our aim is to facilitate remobilization, re enablement, and rehabilitation. Post operative, again, uh, the, we follow the post anesthesia care unit discharge um, criteria. And we review the perioperative morbidity, mortality in the various meetings, and we consider appropriate level of post-operative care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chavi. Now I have a few questions uh, for you. I can, we can start with you only. First, first of all, I would like to know okay, what is the best time to do surgery in these patients because they are elderly patients. And if prolonged prolongation uh, immobilization will lead to so many problems, in, in your opinion, what is the best time to uh, do the surgery in this patient? As early as possible. So, early as possible means less than six hours? So that depends upon the patient condition of the patient. If there is something we can optimize, we try to do that. But if there are certain irreversible conditions, then we go ahead with the surgery, taking all the precautions. Like okay. invasive monitoring, and if required, we go for regional anesthesia. Informed consent, we take the relatives into. Second point, what is your opinion about doing an invasive monitoring in these patients? Should it be done in all the patients or no. should it be done in only selected few? So selected patients, we, uh, we are doing a lot of uh, hip fracture surgery, sir. And we go for invasive monitoring quite frequently, depending upon the condition of the patient. Like if the patient has some cardiac issues, we go in for invasive monitoring. We don't put a central line and we generally tend to use a regional anesthesia if possible. That's and uh, what is the uh, experience of uh, putting a block in these patients? So we put a lot of blocks, fascia, normally I use a femoral nerve block, but fascia, Laka also my colleagues are using. 
and these are first of all very helpful in maintaining the uh, position of the patient and because at times we find that we need to use regional anesthesia and the patient doesn't give us the position so there we are very nice. comfortable with the nerve blocks and yes, now it is they are doing a lot of nerve blocks before even before surgery also for positioning and all that and one last question you said about bcis so are you are you doing any pre, are you doing giving taking any precautions for bcis bone cement implantation and no 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 sir no we are not uh, we just careful we keep the patient hydrated and that's it okay. because usually they say you should keep the patient a little over hydrated in these conditions when the cement is being implanted cement implantation yes sir right thank yes, you sir. and i can request professor jitendra to take over please sir so, chavi i have one question for you like usually what happens is like these guidelines come from western countries where the patients uh, are you know taken very good care of in pre operative period while we work at place where you know most of the time patients are neglected because the attendant is concerned that they had a fracture mm-hmm. and they keep on running about for that so uh, how do you ensure that the that the, that your patient is adequately hydrated you know so that you can uh, follow the iras protocol there or do you have some protocol that this is the amount of fluid you are going to give before you give a regional anesthetic in your patient um dr jitender as of now we are not using iras protocol for these patients and uh, it is uh, like depending upon the condition of the patient like if we feel that a patient can be convenient we try to take up as i mean we are a little liberal with these patients i mean even yeah. if hmm. so and that, uh, what do you use what do you use for volume monitoring in these patients like do you go for um, ivc compressibility or do you take ppv what do you use for mm. see normally we try we can't hear you chavi we can't hear you we can't hear you chavi so by the time chavi yeah probably the connection is lost so by the time the chavi is back a quick question for swagata uh uh okay a quick question of for swakta swakta so you know many a times it happens is that we come across patients who have uh, you know associated head injury and they come for open skeletal trauma so uh, do you have any experience on you know what is the outcome of these patients after they receive a general anesthetic like severe head injury but an emergency non uh, you know non brain surgery so it is uh, you know skeletal surgery so do you have any experience of Uh, you know what happens what is the outcome of the, these patients yes uh, professor jit i'll just repeat your question because the voice is not that clear you are asking me about the outcomes of coexistent traumatic brain injury with peripheral trauma is that right skeletal trauma skeletal uh, for uh, you know where we need to take up the patient for emergency surgery because the trauma is probably a grade 3 grade 3 open fracture which cannot wait for more than 48 hours yes. so um uh, the exact indian data of the outcomes i may not be able to tell you but the evidence uh, based that if it is mild to moderate traumatic brain injury and then we can take up skeletal trauma along with it but as we just heard in the last lecture it may be better to go as far as possible for regional blocks if it is uh, possible or if we are giving anesthesia we have to take care of the basics of management of the uh the physiological management that i spoke about that has to be taken care of or if possible yeah. if it is a severe traumatic brain injury then external fixation and other things can be done till the brain condition improves or the icp is stable very yeah, early that may not be ideal uh, so got a one 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 more question please sir i would like to know you have talked about sedation to these patients so sir. which sedative you would like to give to these patients now uh, if we are talking about sedation for intubation in the er at that That's time right. anything starting yes. from ketamine to uh, fentanyl the only limitation would be the blood pressure so if the blood pressure is good then it's as simple as using propofol routine if it is not ketamine is equally uh, available to us etomidate but the idea is to reduce the icp in the early and if you're looking at continuous sedation then fentanyl oh. 
or propofol depending on the blood pressure midazolam is a little uh, not favored now that is what i wanted to ask because sedation with me is mainly midazolam for the pgs so they should be clear about it that it should not be given in these patients yes sir and uh, another question swakta thank, thank you sir what is the role of non invasive uh, you know monitoring you said that icp monitoring is uh, because you know there are concerns when it comes to invasive monitoring with many centers but nowadays ultrasound is easily available so what is the role of uh, onst or other non invasive monitoring in uh... Uh, we are definitely routinely using onst the only thing we need to uh, kind of keep reminding our residents is that it is uh, only so dependable in the first rise of icp so once you are treating it and the icp starts coming down the changes in the diameter may be <laughs> lagging behind a lot so to detect a sudden increase in icp osnd is definitely good and you can only do that if you have a baseline value with you yeah agreed and uh, i have a question for uh, dr kajal uh, madam what is the role of point of care testing in uh, you know in uh, resuscitation hmm. no Well, there are two questions. I can see Doctor Nijhavan here. He has also put in one question. Ji, first I'll answer his question. Okay, okay, ma'am. He is uh, he has written in the chat box that on one on one hand we are saying do permissive hypotension, and in the last lecture we said the patient uh, should not be exposed to lower pressures. Yes, you are right. We cannot do that in certain subset of patients. So, so in pregnant patients. in patients with traumatic brain injury and geriatric patients you need to keep your pressures at the uh, you know recommended guide as per the recommended guidelines so that part is correct uh, now coming to the second question uh, point of care testing well when we talk about damage control resuscitation we are talking about settings which are very very urgent one is the pre hospital settings and i don't think we are going to find any point of care testing in the pre hospital settings and number 2 is in the er okay fine in er studies are coming looking at uh, thromboelastometry but they haven't found a place in the guidelines it will be a good idea if you have an access one thing is that to get the first sample through it will take 10 to 15 minutes so don't just be guided by thromboelastometry as the first line of management if you have it and you can do it it would be good to do a point of care testing but it is not right now the gold standard thank you madam and we have another question for you here in chat box which says should we practice hypotensive resuscitation in polytrauma patients with mild or moderate gcs as they are likely to be associated with poor outcomes in trauma patient in tba management so well if the patient is actively bleeding and exsanguinating patient is not able to maintain his pressures then you have to go ahead with it don't have to go ahead in mild to mild to moderate injuries which can be managed with the the conventional you know because this is a you know it's not a single thing damage control resuscitation is three things together one is permissive hypotension second is balanced resuscitation and third is damage control surgery because your patient is actively bleeding so if your patient is actively bleeding go ahead with it here yeah, to stop How far you may be able to go, Doctor Kajal, in permissive Sir? hypotension? Sir, Kajal, my question is: How far you may be able to go with the permissive hypotension? So we have a map of fifty, sir. For in the time limit is sixty minutes. Fifty. Mean arterial pressure fifty, systolic blood pressure of seventy uh, to eighty. and time limit is 1 hour do you think if the heart rate is high do you still allow to go for 60 minutes with that particular pressure yes yes because it it will be high only because you are expecting more than 2 liters of loss it's a massive hemorrhage exsanguinating patient definitely there will be some compensatory mechanism uh, going on but so the idea is to buy, it is just the the idea is to buy time till you can you know get hold of the blood and blood products it is not that you let the patient's bp be low and don't do anything all the strategies have to go hand in hand so once you have a low blood pressure you are keeping the pressures low and you are doing a balanced resuscitation patient's heart rate will come up will i mean like settle down no but if I'm you do not, not do i am not worried with a low rate 
if the rate is high, my left ventricular output is going to be less and less. So is it permissible at that stage? Sir, this is a time bound activity. It time has to be time. done when the patient is actively bleeding and you have to take control by doing three strategies all put together. It is not recommended in day to day scenario with all patients. It happens, damage control measures have to be instituted if your patient is actively bleeding and you, you, you are resuscitating that kind of a patient. So in short, in damo, damage control decision, say something like 20 to 30 percent reduction in the pressure for that particular age group could be allowed, is it? Yes, yes, correct. And again, do you believe in on-site block or on arrival peripheral nerve block? to reduce the pain so, on site well, if you are going out uh, or if you remain in the casualty or emergency on arrival block. Do you propose to you on arrival block? Sir, I think the question is to Chavi, but I, uh, I feel all of us are going to say yes to that. The only thing are the logistics, like the, uh, as anesthetist, if we are, uh, you know, we are attending to the emergency and casualty by ourselves, then we can do it. But if we have to be called, we may miss that golden hour when we have to give the block. So it's more about the availability. And as the chief of all seniors are here in this uh, meeting, I think we should take it forward and ask for anesthesiologist presence in the you know emergency room. You know, this then we can really, go ahead with this. This was really popular till two, three years back. But once you give that much of local anesthetics, it's going to vasodilate and increase the bleeding. Is it recommended? That's the reason I will put in the question. Uh, well, sir, uh, right, right. These days on you do a lot of blocks. Or on site block, if you are going to give, you are going to give with the local anesthesia that's going to dilate the vessels and increase the bleeding. So, is it recommended? So, there is no uh, guideline as of now, but yeah. people are practicing worldwide. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. the doses which they use are lower doses and they are not the anesthetic doses. The doses are much lower because they are analgesic dosages actually. The yeah, they are only controlling pain. Okay. They are analgesic dosages actually. And, and okay. second thing sir, is that we are doing peripheral nerve blocks. So there is very limited, uh, there are very limited chances of hypotension. We are not doing an epidural or a spinal where we would expect sympathetic blockade and vasodilatation. So facial right, right. or um, femoral nerve block uh, should not be associated with any hypotension. Dr. Chavi, that can means you it's really limited extent vasodilatation possible. That may be the reason you are putting it. And another question to Swagada. Swagada, you were telling about the peripheral pre-hospital settings and a traumatic brain injury. Could you make it more clear? Peripheral hospital setting setting which is not that popular in India. In fact, I, I believe that's the way you are talking. Yes, I was uh, saying that pre-hospital management yeah, pre-hospital pre setting, yes. correct. Pre Traumatic brain injury yeah. uh, may not be something we can uh, uh, extrapolate the evidence from the West because all said and done it is almost absent in India and uh, the time from injury to uh, what we see is perhaps it's like a scoop and run is how we see our patients. So pre-hospital management uh, is what we do in our ER. I mean, it's in everywhere. We say scoop and run, not limited to India. Everywhere, all over the world, it's still the scoop and run. Uh, yes, sir. But there is some management going on by the scoopers, yeah. uh, which for us doesn't happen. They actually worsen the spine and they just pick him, pick the patient up on an auto and bring to us. Yeah. So uh, we may be a little less advantaged that way. But whenever we get the patient should be when we see them first and start the early TBI management is what and I was trying unless to say. Unless you have a good paramedic who is really Absolutely. drilled into this particular matter, don't attempt for any sort of a dramatic measure there, is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Now we hand over the mic to Professor. Hello. Uh, 
anybody with more questions otherwise we can think of winding up i don't know whether this dr jayeshri or dr baljit going to wind up this evening hmm well, what would professor baljit i suppose oh yeah well uh, friends very interesting uh, webinar i must say that and uh, interesting presentations full of academic uh, knowledge and uh, full of experience as well and uh, dr kajal jain highlighted the role of uh, permissive hypotension uh, for a short period of time and uh, she did justify uh, you know with various studies uh, as to what are the benefits that we accrue from this and uh, likewise dr uh, chavi uh, highlighted the uh, you know the recent guidelines that we have with regard to fracture uh, fever in old patients and of course dr sanjay tripathi with our uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, experience from uh, neurocritical care highlighted the role of uh, uh, monitoring of these patients uh, during surgery uh well uh, we certainly are going and is uh, going back uh, after this webinar uh, despite the internet connection problems i think everybody enjoyed it so i mean i also enjoyed it very much and on behalf of uh, the president and uh, you know the whole executive of indian college of anesthesiologists first of all i thank the uh, moderators uh, uh, for for very well conducted session and of course no denying that excellent speakers they did a great job and uh, thank you so much uh, you know all the speakers for wonderful lectures thank you so much and good night thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank, thank you very much thanks thank a lot thank you ma'am and uh, we really enjoyed and such imp such an important topic and so well covered by all of you it was very very informative thanks a lot and good thank night you. thank you ma'am thank you